So, Father God, we thank you and we bless you in this place today. And we do reiterate what we've been singing the last few moments. You are great. And we praise you for your greatness, Lord God. We thank you that you know better than we do. You see further than we could ever see. And that everything you do or allow into your lives is for your glory and our good. You are a good, good Father. And we bless you for that. Now, Father, would you speak to us? Speak to us. We, we need to hear a word from you on this last day of 2017. God, we want to be prepared for the kind of people you would have us to be moving into 2018. To that end, Lord God, I pray that you would use me as your voice and vessel at this moment with all of my cracks and flaws, that you would use me much the same way you used a bush to talk to Moses Use me. Deposit a word into our hearts. Save those who don't know you. Bring those who do know you but have not been walking with you back home. And for all of us, Lord God, would you inflame our affections for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about every single week, we... Um, we put the verses on the screen. Um, part of that is just because um, we want to always be a place. In fact, just about every message I preach, I'm always thinking about those who don't know Jesus. Um, and so the, the church isn't to be some kind of a sorority or fraternity, this kind of insider's club where, where only those privileged few kind of hear insider talk. Uh, Jesus, when he, when he spoke, he spoke in such a way that anybody could really understand him until he made the decision to go towards parables. But that doesn't belabor the point that church is for everybody. And so we understand that there are many of you here today who um, maybe don't own a Bible. Um, uh, in this age of technology, there's all kinds of wonderful Bible apps. Um, I would encourage you to download them. Most of them are for free. The one I, uh, I teach out of is the English Standard Version. Uh, I teach out of it because it's, it's extremely readable, but it's also true to the original languages as well. But nonetheless, I just want to exhort all of us who do own Bibles to bring them uh, with you uh, to church for several reasons. Uh, number one, uh, it was said of the Bereans that uh, when Paul taught the church at Berea or the Bereans, that they actually followed along to see if what he was saying was true. So you, you need to get to the point where you are so entrenched in the word that you can check what I'm saying or any human being is saying against the truth of God's word. So I am not perfect and uh, I get stuff wrong and you need to know the word of God so much that you could actually say, ah, pastor was a little off there. All right. So you need to know the word for yourself. And in order to do that, you need to actually own the word. Philippians chapter three. I want to talk on this last day of 2017 about the greatest thing you can do in 2018. The greatest thing you can do in 2018. To help us with this, I want to look at the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 3. I've only got two big points to make in this service. And then tonight, uh, I'm going to give about a 15-minute exhortation where I'll give you the last point, okay? So come back tonight and track with us there. Uh, again, really do want to invite you tonight. Tonight's going to be a, a wonderful, wonderful time. I grew up in the black church, and um, one of the things I just made a mental note of as a young child that I would never do um, uh, when I was an adult would be to go to a watch night service. Anybody ever been to a watch night service? Um, they're wonderful, but as kids, that wasn't, that wasn't too fun for us. Uh, we'd get to church about 7, 8 o'clock at night and stay to about 12.30 in the morning. So we're just going to do till 6 to 9 tonight. And uh, half of that's going to be food and fellowship. And the other half is worship and, and teaching. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and make note of this word, glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. 
circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as, underline this word, it is quite possibly the strongest word Paul ever used, rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. I love this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. The one thing we must do in 2018. On May 12, 1848, Sam Brennan uttered the shot heard round the world. Right here in San Francisco, he began walking up and down Montgomery Street again on May 12, 1848, holding a a little jar in his hand filled with gold dust. Walking up and down Montgomery Street in San Francisco, he began to shout as loud as he could, gold, gold, gold. Within three days, the male population of San Francisco left. They made their way to the American River in search for this gold where Sam Brennan had gotten his. One year later, in 1849, sociologists estimate that some 80,000 men came to the state of California in search of gold. These men had come as far as the East Coast. They had left loved ones. They had left their wives, they left their children, they had left um, the security of social networks, they had left well-paying jobs, many of them hopped on stagecoaches, uh, trains were not a popular means of transportation yet, and this journey by stagecoach would take upwards of four or five months. Some would hop on ships, and back then there was no Panama Canal, so literally you would hop on a ship maybe in New York and sail all the way around the tip of South America and then back on up about a five-month journey. Many of these individuals suffered sickness. Others were attacked by Indians on the way out here. Why did they go through all the suffering and sickness? Why did even some give up their lives? Well, the answer is clear. Gold had been their treasure. And when something is your treasure, you spare no expense. When something is your treasure, you reorient your life around it. If I wanted to know what you treasured, I just need to look at your checkbook. Whatever you treasure, money flows freely to it. When something is your treasure, everything about your life changes to accommodate that. Here is Paul. He's sitting in prison as he writes the Philippians. Several hundred years before Sam Brennan had uttered his shot heard round the world, the Apostle Paul had found an even greater treasure, Jesus Christ. Prior to meeting Jesus Christ, Paul was spending his life as a Jew, stooped in Judaism. In fact, not only was he steeped in Judaism, he was actually radicalized. He was a part of a sect of Judaism that had become quite militant to the point of killing people that they pose to be a threat to their way of life. Paul's job when we meet him prior to Christ in the book of Acts was he persecuted people who called themselves Christians. He walked into their homes. He accosted them. He threw them in jail. He had them flogged. At times, he even was complicit in their murder, like in the murder of Stephen. He was that zealous for the faith. 
But all that changed one day when he was walking down a dusty road called Damascus, Acts chapter 9. Jesus Christ, the hound of heaven, literally stopped him in his tracks. He, per, he, he broke through the clouds, and Jesus says, Paul, Paul at the time, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Jesus Christ moved in, and as he does with everybody he's ever saved, he totally flipped his world upside down. This man who one day was persecuting Christians, the next day had become a Christian. And now we find him in jail. Why? He was suffering for Christ because Christ had become his treasure. We know that Christ is his treasure because he says these words in verses 7 and 8, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, he says, I count everything as loss because of, underline this phrase, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Paul says, you looked at my life, Jesus Christ is number one. Everything else is a far distant second. Jesus Christ took preeminence over money. Jesus Christ even took preeminence over Paul's family. One of the great scholarly debates that we used to have in my New Testament classes is, we used to wonder, was Paul ever married? Theologians debate that point vociferously, and part of the reason for the debate is Paul never makes mention of his wife or kids. Now, the reason why is because Paul so treasured Jesus Christ that even his own family took a back seat. Jesus Christ was numero uno. He considered Christ of surpassing worth. Not too long ago, I took my boys to the mall, and uh, we were walking around, and one of my boys uh, made a strange request that somewhat offended me. He said, Dad, uh, would you buy me a pair of Gucci slides? Now, if you don't know what slides are, in my day, we called them flip-flops. Dad, would you buy me a pair of Gucci flip-flops? And then to soften the blow, he says, they're not that much, Dad, only a couple hundred dollars. Now, y'all need to pray for me because I about lost my mind. And I immediately responded, letting him know in no uncertain terms, will I ever buy you Gucci anything? couple hundred dollars for some flip-flops boy have you lost your mind now this son of mine needs to be a lawyer because you could you could tell he had thought long and hard about this and he knew what my defense was going to be and before I was even able to finish my defense he hit me with a counterpunch he says uh, when I said to him son I'll never buy you anything Gucci I'll never pay that much money for anything he immediately responded but dad I have seen you spend a lot more money on mom to which I didn't even flinch. I said, that's right. You know why I spend a lot more money on your mama than you? No. I said, son, because I love her more than you. I'm not even bashful about it. It's Jesus, your mama, then you. She's the queen of the house. In fact, son, let me, in, let, you, let me let you in on a little insider secret here. Your mama knows this. She can about talk me into anything. She is, in the Luritz home, outside of Christ, of surpassing worth. And she knows this. And trust me, my checkbook points to it. Whatever's your treasure, money flows freely to it. Whatever you treasure you will embrace suffering for. Whatever you treasure, you will allow to inconvenience you. I've got to ask you a question as we prepare to step into 2018. Is Christ your treasure? Is Jesus Christ of surpassing value in your life? Is he numero uno? Is there anything that even competes with Christ in your life? Jesus Christ must be treasured. This is important because 2017 has been a crazy year, hasn't it? This has probably been the most tumultuous year of my lifetime. It seems as if every sector of our society is dangling by a thread. There's always been racial division, but, but in my lifetime, the racial chaos and confusion is at a whole nother level. 
the events of Charlottesville and other events and the Black Lives Matter movement and police brutality, so on and so forth, has revealed something we've all intuitively known, that there, there is division ethnically in our nation. Not only that, but 2017 has also revealed that there are men who have abused their power and have taken advantage sexually of women. What these men have done to women is reprehensible. It seems as if every sector of society, there are new stories coming out of powerful men who have abused their power to berate and belittle women. I'm so grateful for the hashtag me too, but it should be Christians who are right at the front of the line, Christian men saying, here's what the Bible teaches, we value women. And then there's the White House. There's been all kinds of chaos there. And I mean not, I don't try to offend you. I'm not anti-Trump or whatever, but there's just been a hot mess in Washington, D.C. This need not cause us to fret. Trump is not king of kings or lord of lords. Jesus is. But our society is fractured. What's going to get us back on track, what's going to usher in the kingdom of God is not the power we wield at the voting booth. That's not the way Jesus went about things when he came to earth. He didn't go the political route. He didn't gather his followers together and say, we've got to get Caesar out of here. For Jesus would say, my kingdom is not of this world. You've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. I have a problem with any Christian who is a member of a political party, but not a member of the local church. Preach, Pastor. Any Christian who is a member of a political party, but not a member of the local church, is saying, my hope is in donkeys or elephants. Government is not the hope of the world. Christ is. So how did Jesus sought to instigate change? He says, I'm going to gather 12 individuals. I'm going to spend three years with them for one purpose. I want these 12 men to fall in love with me. Then when Acts comes, he boards a cloud, goes back to heaven, and unleashes 12 men who treasure Jesus Christ. And that treasuring of Christ becomes contagious, and it caused them to flip the world on its ear. But it began with a decision to treasure Christ. Our problem is the body of Christ is overrun with lukewarm individuals who have minimized following Jesus to quiet times and church attendance and giving money at best. Paul shows us in this text that you can do outwardly righteous things and not treasure Christ. I can take my wife to the movies. That doesn't mean I love her. I can take her out to dinner. That doesn't mean I'm a great husband. In fact, some of me, me and my wife's biggest arguments is me doing the right things, but from a wrong heart. What my wife intuitively wants to know is, do I treasure her? Dave Kinneman, president, good friend of mine on the Barna Group, every year he releases a study on Christians in culture called Barna Trends. And Dave Kinneman in his latest study says this, look at it with me. This study shows the extent of Christian commitment in the nation. More than 150 million Americans say they have professed faith in Christ. Something's wrong. This impressive number provokes the question of how well this commitment is expressed. As much of our previous research shows, Americans' dedication to Jesus is, in most cases, a mile wide and an inch deep. How can we have all these churches on all these corners with all these pastors, with all these worship leaders, and still have all this mess? We've got too many lukewarm Christians. 
We need people who will treasure Christ. We don't need more arguments on Facebook. We need people to treasure Jesus. We don't need more political pundits. We need people who treasure Jesus. We don't need more mean-spirited banter on social media platforms. We need people who treasure Jesus, who say, Jesus, you are of surpassing worth. How do we do that? Let me give you two points and we'll call it a day. As Paul sits down to write, he has visited Philippi. He has led these believers to faith in Jesus Christ. And then he's landed in jail. After landing in jail, he gets a disturbing report that the church at Philippi has been infiltrated by some people who call themselves Christians known as the Judaizers. Now, we're going to unpack that. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about the Judaizers as we get into the Galatians series. But you need to understand the Judaizers pretty much said, they, they, they said to these Gentile Christians, listen, now that you follow Jesus Christ, we want you to understand that Christ is not enough. In order for you to be really saved, you now need to be circumcised and do the works of the law. That what Jesus did for you on the cross is not enough. In order for you to get to the varsity side of the kingdom and wear your varsity letterman jacket, you must now do certain things and attach it to what Christ did on the cross in order for you to now be sufficient in Jesus. This kind of stuff continues to go on today. It is Christians thinking that now that I'm a follower of Jesus, what really makes me legit is Jesus plus Bible studies. It's Jesus plus church attendance. It's Jesus plus giving money. And these things now kind of become hand sanitizer for guilty consciences. Paul sits down and says that to add anything to Jesus insults the finished work of the cross. In essence, what Paul says, listen now, is that Christ plus anything equals nothing. But Christ plus nothing equals everything. I'll give it to you again. The message of Scripture is Christ plus anything equals nothing. But Christ plus, uh, I said that wrong, Christ plus nothing equals everything. That's the message Paul is trying to give. Now, Paul says, listen, don't go the way of the Judaizers. Here's what I want you to understand. I've been there. Paul is a man who grew up in Judaism, who gave himself to the law. And notice what he says in verse 2. I want you to look out for the dogs. This is what he calls the Judaizers. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh, which is a play on word for the concept of circumcision. And then he says in verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Now he gives us his spiritual resume. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, meaning I'm an ethnic Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. This was a statement of status. This is where Israel's first king came from. Saul, he was a Benjamite, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. This is an impressive resume. But then he begins, he concludes by saying, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Amazing. I told you a couple weeks ago that the idea of a resume is it's simply a document containing all of our all of our accomplishments, and we wave them to a potential employer, saying, "Say, I need you to to hire me." See, this stuff should impress you. Where I went to school, what I did. This is what Paul is getting at. This is his resume, and yet Paul says, "My resume, all that I've accomplished in this world, when you compare it to Christ, it's nothing." I know I'm talking to very accomplished people. Very accomplished people. Some of you, your resume is astounding. Valedictorian in high school, went to Stanford, graduated with honors, maybe then went to an Ivy League school to get your uh, master's degree. Maybe then you got a PhD from MIT, and then maybe you were the CEO of that startup that went public, and wonderful, wonderful, wonderful in the economy of the world. But I don't say this to insult you. When you compare that to the economy of Christ, nothing. It is means nothing. To give you a feel for this, imagine I walk over to Google's offices right down the street here in Mountain View, 
And um, I don't know the name of the specific department, but I finagled my way into an interview trying to get a job, um, maybe making uh, improvements to Google Maps. And the uh, potential employer looks at me and says, why should I hire you? And I tell him, well, I started preaching when I was 17, then went to Bible college, got my degree in in, in Bible. Then from there, I went to seminary and uh, got a master's degree in theology. And I've interned with some of the best preachers uh, ever. I'm the senior pastor at Abundant Life, and I help to consult churches on how to become multi-ethnic, and I preach all over the world. That's why you should hire me. Now, once he gets finished laughing, he's going to look me in my eyes and say, your resume is impressive in the world of Christendom, but here at Google, it means nothing. Are you getting a feel for this? You going to Stanford or you being a a major leader in the tech world, you accomplishing all that you've accomplished, you owning a home in the Bay is like me taking Monopoly money into Bank of America trying to make a deposit. It may carry currency in the world, but when it comes to Christ, it means nothing. Now, Pastor, what are you saying here? Here's what I'm saying. If you're going to treasure Christ, you must first repent of your resume. If you are going to treasure Christ, you must first repent of your resume. I'm here to tell you as an outsider who's just gotten into uh, the Bay, I've been here coming up on two years. I love living here. It's wonderful. But the affluence here and the arrogance here is nauseating. I want you to understand, we get to heaven, ain't going to be no gated communities in heaven, ain't going to be no um, um, housing projects in heaven, ain't going to be no you know, other side of the tracks in heaven. And in a twist of sovereign irony, God may have as your housemate some uneducated old woman who loved Jesus in Soweto during the apartheid years, and here you are with your Ph.D., It's interesting to me, if you look at any top 10 lists that we're in in the Bay Area, we're at the top 10 for affluence, cost of living, and at the top 10 for being secular, unsaved. Our resume is a barrier for us intimately connecting to Jesus. I say this all the time to my church in Memphis just get nauseated. I've sent my kids to private schools, but just all these parents putting private school bumper stickers, and listen, I'm not judging or impugning anyone's motives, but I I don't, I haven't heard too many kids say, hey, mom, can you put the bumper sticker on? Most of the times, it's parents doing that, and I go, now, why do you do that? I never saw a bumper sticker from some inner city high school in the bowels of a ghetto. We love our status. We love our resume. And Paul says that is the problem. Treasure Christ more than your degree, more than your pedigree, more than your zip code, more than your bank account. Treasure Christ. We're going to treasure Christ. Not only must we repent, first of all, repenting of our resume, but second of all, this is going to sound weird, we need to repent of our righteousness. We need to repent of our righteousness. Verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, all things, all things, and count them as rubbish. In order that I may be found in Christ, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own. Unbelievable. Biblically speaking, righteousness is the idea of being in right relationship with God. How does that happen? That happens one way and one way only through the finished work of Jesus Christ. But there's other righteousness, these are pseudo righteousness. 
Paul talks about one, a righteousness of his own. What is he getting at here? He's getting at a righteousness that comes through the law. Look back up to verse 6. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, here it is, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Watch it. Paul grew up steeped in Judaism, and they had something called the law. The law was a standard of 613 do's and don'ts. Paul makes an astounding statement. He said, back in the day, I was blameless when it came to the law. Now, this drives scholars nuts. I won't get into the weeds of it, but how can you be blameless when you had a perfect standard? He's not saying that I never broke the law because remember, a part of the law was a whole section on what to do when you screwed up the law called sacrifices. Paul says, I was blameless. He's not saying I never made a mistake. What he is saying is, I was so meticulous in my observance of the law that even when I made a mistake, I still was blameless because I covered for the mistake the right way by offering the right sacrifice. But all that changed when he met Christ. And now notice what he says about his righteousness. He says, I count it as rubbish. He's writing in Greek, and the Greek word for rubbish is skubala. Say skubala. It's not a nice word. It is a foul word. It means dung, excrement, dog poop. There's other words I would, I would say, but they're not appropriate. What does Paul say about his righteousness? dung. If me trying to do a Bible study to gain points with God and to be acceptable with him, dog dung. If I had a one night stand the other night, then I want to write a tithe check to God to feel better. God looks at it and says, dog dung. If that language offends you, you can email me at the apostle Paul said it.com. Any attempt to get in good standing with God outside of Jesus Christ is dog excrement. That's what he says. A young man went to go visit a foreign nation in the 1930s. While there, he was astounded by what he saw. During his travels there to this foreign nation, he kept a journal And in this journal, he said, this nation is really impressive. Its leadership is the most virtuous leadership I've seen. Pornography is outlawed. Women are encouraged to dress modestly. If their skirts don't go a certain length, they're fined, even thrown in jail. Even gangster movies are prohibited. In fact, he said, its leader even frowns against smoking. Now, that sounds wonderful until you realize who that man was writing about. He was writing about Germany under the Hitler regime. That's right, Adolf Hitler outlawed pornography. Adolf Hitler outlawed gangster movies. And Adolf Hitler made sure that women's skirts were were a certain length. And Adolf Hitler had a problem with people smoking. He had an outward righteousness, and yet we understand that he was one of the most vile men ever, exterminating millions of people. This is the problem with an outward righteousness. It breeds a kind of legalistic hypocrisy that puts on airs to the world, and it looks wonderful on the outside, but inside is a dead, decaying heart. That's why Paul would say in Matthew chapter 23 of Pharisees who, excuse me, Jesus would say of Pharisees who Paul used to be a part of that these are whitewashed graveyards full of dead men's bones. They look wonderful, but they're dead. In the weeks to come, we're going to be studying the book of Galatians, and I want you to track with me. We're going to put a full court press on legalism, and I'm going to share some out of some of my own wounds. And I got millions of stories to tell you, but let me just share one with you. I grew up down south, and it would always grate on me, even as a little boy, to hear the white evangelical Christian community down south saying and bemoaning the fact that they had taken prayer out of schools. They can't believe the government has taken prayer out of schools. And our problem is we don't pray in schools, and we got to get back to praying in schools. 
schools. As a kid, I found that to be odd because when we did have prayer in schools, blacks couldn't go to those schools. Do you not see the hypocrisy there? Do you not see it? Praying, but racist. You can read your Bible, but be greedy. You can come to church, but be promiscuous. You cannot see certain movies, but be slanderous. Outward things may impress the world, but you ain't fooling God. What matters to God, what matters to God, what matters to God is the heart. That's why God says, when I change you, here's what I do. Ezekiel chapter 36, when I get into you, I don't change you from the outside in. I change you from the inside out. I give you a new heart. God says, if I can get you a new heart, then the actions will follow. I was once approached by an elderly woman at one of the, pastors I church, uh, at one of the churches I pastored, and she said to me, Pastor, why don't you ever talk about tithing here? I said, Mother, you may be the first person in the history of Christendom to encourage their pastor to talk about money. I said, here's why. I said, believe it or not, I talk about it every week. I just don't say it. The emphasis here isn't on tithing. It's on falling in love with Jesus. Because if Jesus gets your heart, he'll get your checkbook. But it's possible to give him your checkbook without giving him your heart. Do you treasure Jesus? So what are you saying, Pastor? Are you saying I don't need to be celibate? Are you saying I don't need to read the Bible? Are you saying I don't need to give my money? What, what, what are you saying here? Imagine there's a young man in our church, and he's finishing up his Ph.D. He's all excited to graduate when all of a sudden he's given a piece of devastating news. The people in the registrar's office says, uh, young man, we don't know how this slipped our minds, but um, there's one more thing you have to do that we forgot to tell you in order for you to get the Ph.D. conferred upon you. You've got to learn German, and you've got to take a test in which you read a newspaper article that's in German, and you translate it into English. Do that, and then you can graduate. He's devastated. He's all ready to graduate. It's the middle of summer, so what does he do? He goes out and hires a tutor to tutor him in German, and for three hours a night, five days a week, they sit down, and this tutor tutors him in German. Do you think he wants to be there? Probably not. Do you think he's fully engaged? Probably not. Do you think there's joy in him? Probably not. Why? Because he's there just to check something off the list. But now imagine this same man has fallen in love with a young woman, and this young woman doesn't speak a lick of English. She only speaks German. He realizes that he's not going to be able to get close to her, not going to be able to experience a relationship with her unless he learns German. So he goes out and he hires a tutor who for three hours a night, five days a week, tutors him in German. Do you think old boy is going to show up every single day? Do you think he's going to have a sense of joy? Do you think he's going to be fully engaged? Do you think he's going to try to digest all the information? Why? Why the disparity? In one case, it's to check an item off the list that I can get something that'll make me look good. In the other case, it's all motivated and fueled by relationship. Yes, we read our Bible, but Bible reading is not an end unto itself. It's a means for us to walk in relationship with the God who saved us. Yes, we give, but giving is not an end unto itself. It's our way to say thank you for a God who has blessed us. So yes, we do good things, but those good things never become an end unto themselves. We do them because holiness is the language of intimacy with God. That's why we do them. Finally, let's go home on this. To treasure Christ means I must repent, first of all, of my resume, secondly, of my righteousness. But finally, if I'm going to treasure Christ, I must relish in Christ. Look at verses 2 and 3 as we prepare to go home. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. 
for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. I love this. And glory, glory, glory in Christ Jesus. Put no confidence in the flesh. Paul is writing in Greek, Greek word for glory. It literally means to stick out the neck. It was an idiom that simply means to boast. Paul says, if Christ is your treasure, then you boast about him. Let me let you in on a little secret. If you want to know what a person treasures, listen to them talk. Listen to them talk. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Some people, you can tell that their kids are of surpassing worth. It's all they ever talk about. Other people, their job is of surpassing worth. It's all they ever talk about. Other people, it's, it's their jobs. It's of surpassing worth. Or their education, it's of their surpassing worth. It's all they ever talk about. But if Christ is your surpassing worth, you talk about him. Is he your treasure? Is he your treasure? For Paul, Christ was his boast. 1 Corinthians 1, 31, Paul says these words, that the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. What this means, friends, is if we're going to treasure Christ, boasting in him, there is no room for arrogance. I can't boast in myself and boast in Christ at the same time. If I'm going to boast in Christ, I must be humble. John Wooden, the famed UCLA coach, said these words. Look at it with me. Talent is God-given. Be humble. Fame is man-given. Be grateful. Conceit is self-given. Be careful. You can't boast in yourself and boast in Christ at the same time. I love Australia. Been there several times, not a big fan of the cooking, but uh, someone once said in, in hell, the chefs will be Australian. Um, didn't mean to offend anybody. But one of the things I love about Australia is the people. If you've ever been to, to Australia, the, the people are, are some of the, the sweetest, humblest, down-to-earth people ever. Not, not to say they don't struggle with the pride. Pride is universal, but, but they're some of the most self-effacing humble people you'll ever meet. I, my wife and I were there one time. We were sitting with our host, and our host, of course, is a, Australian. I said to him, I just got to tell you, I just find Australians to be incredibly humble, and incredibly self-effacing, incredibly down-to-earth. What's up with Australians and being so humble? He says, do you not know where, where we come from? He says, there's an idiom we use here in Australia called tall poppy syndrome. He says, whenever we feel like an Australian is getting arrogant and boasting in themselves, we always do what we call cut down the tall poppy. And the way we'll cut down the tall poppy is to remind them that the origins of our nation is we share DNA with convicts. Australia was started because England wanted to get rid of its convict and criminal population, so they literally shipped them to the other side of the world, and those became, those became the foreparents of modern-day Australians. So in someone arrogant. Another Australian will cut them down to size and say, let me remind you who you share DNA with. Arrogance is ridiculous. Let me remind you that we all have spiritual DNA that's tainted by sin. Because what Adam and Eve did in the garden, sin has touched and stained us. What makes more is most of what we, we boast about, we had nothing to do with. Paul would say it this way, what do you have that you did not receive? Most of us think that we hit a triple when in reality it was the sovereignty of God that let us be born on third base. Do you really think you would be where you're at if you were an orphan in Rwanda? Be humble. God in his sovereignty has so orchestrated things that you are where you are. And don't insult God by trying to act that you pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps when it was God who gave you the boots. (laughs) 
So Paul made up his mind, if that's the case, I'm not going to boast in myself. I'm going to boast in the Lord. He's going to be my treasure. Friends, as we move into 2018, I know you're contemplating that dreaded R word, resolutions. But if there's one resolution you can make, may you resolve to make Christ your treasure. More than working out, more than eating right, more than paying off debt, may you make Christ your treasure. May Christ be first and foremost. I want to pray today. As we end our services, I, I want to pray. I want to make a call for three kinds of people. One, if you're here today and you would say, I don't know Christ as Lord and Savior of my life. Maybe you're an extremely successful person and praise God for that. But I want you to understand something here. When you die, your degrees ain't coming with you. When you die, your 401k plan ain't coming with you. In fact, if I can really bum you out, someone else is going to enjoy it. Are you really going to stand in the presence of God with your Stanford degree? With your Berkeley degree? That's rubbish. Job says it this way, naked I came into this world and naked I shall return. I've done hundreds of funerals, but I've never seen a U-Haul truck at a gravesite. You ain't taking it with you. So why not live this life for the one thing that matters, Jesus Christ? I can think of no better start to the new year than to surrender your life to him. Someone else, you're here today and you're saying, I do know Jesus Christ, but I got I to tell you, he's not really my treasure. I, I boast in a lot of other stuff. I boast in my resume. I boast in my own righteousness. Christ is not really my treasure. And as we step into 2018, I, I just want prayer. In fact, maybe, maybe you just want to come to one of the crosses and you just want to nail to the cross maybe other things you've been treasuring instead of Jesus. I can think of no better way to enter into 2018 than for you as a believer to say, you know what, there's some things in my life I treasure more than Jesus. And I want to begin 2018 by having Jesus being of surpassing worth. Finally, you're here and maybe you're not a covenant partner. You're not a part of a local church, and God's will for your life is that you would be planted in a church that teaches you the Word, that encourages you in your faith, and that immerses you in a community of believers who can pray for you and support you. We'd love to be that family. And you can take your first start, your first step into covenant partnership by coming down front, and we'll show you the way in which you can lock arms with our body. So I want to pray. At the end of our prayer, if you want to say yes to Jesus, if you want to say, hey, I, I, just, I just want prayer or maybe nailed to the cross, something that you're treasuring more than Jesus, and I want Jesus to be my treasure, or you want to be a part of a church, we'll be here for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Jesus, you didn't just die to set us free. You died, Lord God, that having been set free, that we would treasure you. That we would say with Paul that you are of surpassing worth. More than houses, cars, money, kids, more than relationships, friendships, more than status, more than pedigree. Jesus, you are of surpassing worth. So we want to boast in you. That's how we want to begin 2018. So, Father, would you save souls? Would you tug on the hearts of your people to repent of their sins? And would you add to your church? Do it, Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.